I'm Kyle. I'm a, a Jupyter developer. Uh, in, the, in the past on Jupyter, I used to work on kind of like security systems uh, orchestration. Um, but now I work more on uh, protocols and formats uh, and front end dev and kind of just things that work across the ecosystem. Um, and then within Interact, so I work on this other front end that, that's for the desktop um, and then a variety of different experiences. And that's basically 99.999% front end work. Um, and I was a mathematician, uh, now I just write JavaScript, um, and I run the notebook platform at Netflix. <sighs> so that was, a, that was a good run from the elevator. <laughs> <laughs> right, so, so I, I fell in love with Jupyter and before Jupyter because of the, the experience that I got out of you know, working with a REPL and then working with a notebook. Um, and, and I really want more people to like experience that joy from from both you know working with with the computer, but then working with you know their own data and just kind of having this overall dance with all of it. Um, and so before I was at Netflix, I worked at Rackspace, um, and largely speaking, my work on Jupiter was just for fun. I was a volunteer contributor. I mean, I'm still a volunteer contributor, um, but it was just. Like there was, there, was, there was no purpose in mind in that there weren't, um, like nobody was, had, other than issues, like I didn't, I didn't have any analysts that I was supporting. I didn't have anybody that was, that was really driving why I would go for certain kinds of decisions. And so admittedly, it was a bit of a vacuum. Um, and <clears throat> I guess on some level it was isolating once I realized that I had kind of not seen what was going on. Um, but I was fortunate to come to Netflix because it gave me a lot greater context. Um, it was amazing to see what some of the real pain points were. Like things before, like I could only kind of perceive what they were from issues. And a lot of it's like if you fix something like much further up from what people are describing, like you'll completely like close the loop on what the real issue was. Um, and so now I'm just, I'm really happy to work on uh, just, just anything that, that's going to be able to support analysts of, of different backgrounds. Uh, and so effectively, the way that I think about it, like for me, is that Netflix is kind of my laboratory to, to evaluate how analysts and data scientists and engineers are working with stuff and make the tools better. Uh, and then I'm really happy that that ends up going back into the open source and I get to continue the work that I was doing before. Right. Um, and, and part of that is also finding out, you know, that humans, they always just do exactly what you tell them and they go straight for intended behavior. There's, there's nothing crazy that ever happens. Um, and, and I think some of the big highlights, and it's like, oh, these are, these are areas we need to go after as Jupyter, um, is that the notebook server gets treated like a cheap web server dashboard. And especially if you have the permissions wide open, then and people will try to do it on purpose to leave the permissions open, give them this good way to iterate. They'll create like template notebooks that have a query within them. Um, and they'll, they'll like basically they'll just hand someone this prefab like PySpark setup and job that'll do viz stuff where an analyst probably knows SQL, but they may not know how to do the rest of the work in Python. Um, but it gives them a way to do exploration that's fairly light. Um, I mean, I'm describing, like you're all here at JupyterCon, so I'm like describing things you're like, well, obviously. Jupiter can do all those things. Uh, but then they, you know, they end up tripping on each other's toes without standard practices. Uh, and then another big thing, I mean, like this was kind of obvious to me before, is that you know, people want to, they want to disseminate, they want to share with each other. <clears throat> Let's see. Oh, hey, there's water. I'm going to get some water real quick. <clears throat> right. So for the data platform itself, like generally what we want to do is, is we wanted this nice, smooth experience for, for running code generally on the platform, whether that's in either they're working in Python or if it's just Presto, uh, Presto queries or their Hive queries, um, right? And it spans exploration of data to machine learning to like running production jobs. Um, but it's not really fully cohesive. And people are still, they're going to go back to Tableau for, for exploration and reporting. Um, without, without going to, to Netflix, I wouldn't have realized how good Tableau is. And I didn't want to admit that. Like, 
a few days in. I was like, oh, this is good. I see why people like this, okay. Um, and while I don't think, I don't think Jupiter is gonna like take over that like area, I think someone should you know, keep, keep investing towards the visualization and get you know, Tableau-like stuff out in open source. Um, sometimes machine learning, it gets done in R, and then we ship it in Docker, and then we call that production, and then there you go. Um, then production ETLs run in Hive or Pig, and it's you know, kind of all over the place. Um, and so you know, we don't have a single environment to solve all these problems, and so we want to invest in the tools that, that kind of span this, right? And I mean, not surprisingly, I'm going to tell you that, hey, it's the notebook. Right, and so we can explore data, interact the, with the platform, and then run jobs in, in really simple ways. Uh, and some of, the, some of the main problems that people want to handle um, are reproducible research, uh, collaboration and sharing, uh, and then just generally like improving the runtimes for jobs that weren't easy to productionalize before on the, Spark cluster, on the Hadoop cluster, uh, or they're just too small to make sense to put there. Um, Right, and, and generally it's about you know, reducing the friction, making it a lot easier. Like, you know, if anything, like our goal should be to make sure that people are spending lots of money on jobs and they're just <laughs> wasting all the resources they can. <laughs> but like, you know, it, it's really just like give people access to the point that anybody that comes in to Netflix, like even if they're, if they're an analyst or they were in some certain other area, they should be able to make a query immediately. Like they should be able to come in and find a report, a memo, and then have the, the backing data to it and run it themselves and see what's there, even if they're, they're not a programmer. Right, and so the, the vision statement that I put together for the notebook environment is that you should, that we, that we provide a notebook environment to experiment with data interactively and collaborate with co colleagues quickly and effectively. So I'm, I'm gonna get, get down to earth just a little bit. Oh, and fun fact, so all these slides, these are from Storybots, which is, my, my favorite kid show. <laughs> uh, right, and so, so the data platform itself, um, the main ways that we do it are uh, with a Python library called Craggle. Um, I know I didn't mention it in here, but there's also Genie, but that'll be another slide. Um, Spark is another primary access point. It's in like 20 to 40% of all jobs. Um, and then layers and layers of software, and so we create this big data image, which I guess I should call the big, big data image since it has like all the libraries. And it's the same image used for jobs. Um, and then Genie is, is, is effectively the um, kind of orchestration engine for, for running a lot of jobs. Um, I probably shouldn't call it to somebody else's, but Stitch Fix wrote a really good article on how they use Genie. Um, so I definitely recommend going and looking that up. They put it out just a couple weeks ago. Um, and then for kernels, we provide a whole bunch of kernels that are available for, for Bash and Python with different versions of PySpark, because um, some people need to transition from 1.6 to 2.0, um, or in some cases, they're actually gonna reach, you know, they wanna reach um, Spark 2.1 or Spark 2.2, uh, and we give, give access to all those. Um, and, and at least for Scala, and there will be a talk about this tomorrow that, that I hope people go to that are interested in making the Scala experience better. As Alex Archambault is gonna talk about the Scala kernels and kind of the landscape around them. Uh, but we currently contribute to Apache Tori. Um, it has its warts, um, but we, we run it with our own patches internally. We keep trying to fix up what we can, and we're hoping more people will get involved there. Um, and on top of that, at least for Scala, it doesn't have a matplotlib. So, so some folks at Netflix created Vegas, which, which outputs Vega. So if you've worked with Altair, right, it, it's outputting the same JSON that JSON Vega and Vega Lite spec. Um, but, but you can, it's not, it's not showing it well here, but I mean you can effectively work with Spark data frames um, or other kinds of obje objects and visualize them directly uh, inside the notebooks. Um, so the, the main ways that we provide it are we have this kind of fixed shared allocation, kind of like a multi-tenant host that's over-provisioned um, but has SSH access and is always on. Um, and then these notebooks that you can spawn on demand and request, request the number of GPUs that you want, um, like how much CPU and memory you're, you're gonna need. Uh, and then it has a TTL and we just go ahead and kill it off. And so if you've worked with Tempenby or you've worked with 
Jupyter Hub, it's the, it's the same kind of concept. It's some of the same, kind of, it's some of the same code. Um, but then both of these environments live on top of EFS, and that's Amazon EFS, the Elastic File System. So it's just NFS, um, and that's been phenomenal. Because um, we used to actually put the notebooks directly to S3, uh, but we found people have been much happier just having a file system um, that they know where to work with it. Um, and so like I was saying before about this big data image, it's actually just the same Docker image. And so when I talk about a, a TTL, effectively we're upgrading people all the time. Like over the weekend, their notebook server is gonna get killed off and they'll end up getting a, a new one brought up back on Monday. And so they'll get a bunch of updates and you probably think to yourself, oh my gosh, they change versions on them every week. And so people can create their own virtual environments um, or condo environments if they want to. Um, but, but generally speaking, like we wanna keep people upgraded. We wanna keep all the security patches like moving forward. Um, yeah, like I was saying before, one's basically kind of like a single user notebook. It actually lives on a subdomain, and then another one that's effectively Jupyter Hub like. Uh, I'm going to skip that. Right, and that was about the big data image. Um, and an important thing to do, at least for these, I mean, like we, we treat this like it's a support role, and so people will come in on Slack or post to um, internal Google groups to post to mailing lists. Um, or to a private GitHub repo to kind of post about things. Um, a, a large amount of it is just people asking for features in the Jupyter Notebook, and then you know, we just have to like move that feedback as far into open source as we can. Um, but a lot of times it's also our own platform. and It's sometimes hard for users to tell the difference between is it a Spark problem, a Scala problem, a notebook problem, and you have to like help them navigate that and hope to fix kind of everything for the greater good. Um, so if you want to hear more about the data platform, in particular at Netflix, I recommend two talks. Uh, Kurt Brown gave a talk at Strata uh, just this year, not too long ago. Both the slides are linked in here, and I'll, I'll tweet out um, all of these slides. Um, and then Michelle Ufford put a, a talk on scaling data quality. Um, she's much, much closer to the, to the analysts, um, so she'll have a different perspective if you want to see that. Um, and so when I talked about having all the notebooks on EFS, one big benefit that we have is that we can, we can mount a different server that has the EFS and then just go ahead and render them all. And so we do this with Commuter. And Commuter is, is effectively just like MB Viewer, but it's, it's gonna be more tailored to publishing as well as being able to actually execute code on it. It uses the same React components that are in the Interact desktop app, uh, and we're just, we're just gonna keep pumping stuff out through there. And so, and then another project that we're working on, and this is within the, the Interact org, so if you go to github.com slash interact slash paper mill, um, and get to this, which is effectively being able to execute parameterized notebooks. Um, and so th this is for people that basically wanna go from notebook to notebook. They, they wanna run some amount of parameters inside of it. Uh, I'm actually gonna skip straight to this. So you, you tag a cell with a label, say, oh, hey, this is my parameter cell, and the API for this may change. That's why I put the beta tag on there. Um, but effectively, you, you write code in the first block that you want to have be able to be swapped out. And then when you run it, so here it takes a, a local notebook right out to S3 and then set these parameters. And if you, if you iterate across the parameters, you just run paper mill multiple times, you'd run them with those separate parameters, but you're, you're getting an individual notebook with the outputs and everything in line. Uh, and so this is, this is how we run notebooks as jobs, but none of the scheduling, just literally how we run the notebook. And then, of course, you can also do it from the Python API directly. Uh, this shows NFLX paper mill, but the public paper mill, you can just pip install paper mill. Uh, Right, and so, so when, once you do this and you actually ran like a, just, you, you ran a parallel job across the notebooks, you, can, you could record in each individual cell a particular parameter you cared about, right? You can, you can put an RMSE value in here, right, as, you, as you're gonna do some grid search, and, and then on the side, you can actually access that, that recorded value. So if you had a whole bunch of notebooks you wanted to read from, you could check to see how each of them performed and then dive into them. Um, and at least for a commuter, that's really easy because you're just clicking through each of the created notebooks. 
um, and it lets you pull out, pull out other outputs from the notebooks individually. And so it gives you this way to analyze your notebooks as if they're data themselves. Um, and it's not just for Python, there's actually R bindings um, and you can change the, the same parameters too. So you still get parameterized notebooks. I want it to be a, a bigger feature within Jupyter as if that was a, a real thing for us to be able to set parameters kind of at the start of a notebook. Um, we don't know exactly what to do for that yet. This seems like the easiest experience right now to just have the tags um, and then let people set, set particular values that get overridden. Yeah. And so like I was saying about looking at a, across a bunch of different jobs, so if you look at this one, there's, there's several different file names and then you can see which, which names and values those had and you just get a data frame of notebooks to look at and see how those did. Right, you were, you were I mean the, the, the thing here is that instead of running a script and then just getting some sort of standard output later on, you've got a full notebook that has all the stuff you would normally have in there, including the images, um, any other data frames, anything else, and then you can actually analyze that instead of having to read each one. And so this is an example of how we're submitting jobs. So here's, here's a collection of parameters, and then, we, then we're going ahead and creating a, a job that's gonna run across each of these this is, this is that, that API. So like we have an internal layer to be, be able to just run a job really easily in Netflix. You set up what your job name is and then, then you run this right through. Um, right. Yeah, and so, uh, so one of my colleagues, Eric Massey, who's not here, um, he, he wants to focus also on being able to write write and read data frames to and from tables and like make that really easy and kind of part of paper mill. Um, and we're exploring that a little bit um, and exploring how we might do it with, with Arrow and actually have it as a side artifact but not in the notebook. So it'd be a reference within there but then we'd be able to display it um, with, within our front ends. Um, and then uh, one thing that you know isn't in the Jupyter Notebook right now which is the cell execution time. So we're gonna store it as metadata for now but at least at least make it, so I don't know if you've worked with like Databricks' UI, but in Databricks' UI they show you what the, what the timestamp is for the, the cell runs. And so here we wanna just go ahead and make that a part of the notebook. Um, it's never part of the Jupyter Notebook format by, like, by default. Like we have the information for it, but it's not put in there because we've been worried about what that looks for diffing. But for use cases like these, where you really just want the information, like we're gonna stick it in to make it separate metadata. Uh, and so so these, these are those resources for paper mill themselves. And, uh, yeah. Oh, was that? Oh, you want me to go back? Cool. I could leave it there then and answer questions. So, so the question was, how do you, so with, with paper mill, how do you know, um, how do you know which notebook you're gonna run? Yeah, so, oh, okay, so the, the user knows, because when, when you're creating a notebook that you're gonna run through paper mill, it's not, it's not a service, it's literally just a command line tool. So you would have saved, you save the notebook with whatever name you want, and then you're gonna run it through paper. It works just like MB convert, but with less arguments. Just general questions, and anything specifically. You can, you can ask anything. Ice with soda is fine. Yeah, so the, the question was, for, for enterprise usage of EFS and with people doing version control, how do you manage it on, on this uh, network file system? Um, 
So we also have a slash data mount that is an EBS volume that stays persistent for that, whichever one they're, they're loading off of. Um, and they'll, they'll hit file, like the, it'll be obvious to them that their files aren't loading as fast. And we recommend that they work with stuff inside of slash data instead of on their EFS. Um, that's, No. No, we, we give them we give them backups. Um, what I'd like to do, and actually I wish I would have, oh I meant to put that in, um, was basically kind of the interaction between paper mill and commuter. Um, so commuter, we're kind of we're planning out a publishing API that'll effectively give them version control. Um, it'll probably just be on S3 though, um, and it'll be a linear history because I don't want to I don't want to force anyone to have to do rebases. I want them to just be able to have versions they can go through and kind of like work from. Um, but as far as version controlling a notebook, it's, it just gets really messy, especially if you're not, if they don't have hands-on. So we prefer that people figure that out on their own for what they want to do. Um, I've had at least one person burn themselves. I mean, there's, there's been more. But I mean, recently there was someone that burnt themselves. Um, and I was able to uh, pull their the notebook that they accidentally wrote over from the checkpoints, and if I had to, we're, we make regular backups of the of the EFS volume. But yeah. How does somebody productionize their code? Uh, is productionized is a very like, great term to mean a lot of different things. Oh yeah, definitely. So the question is, so the question is, how how do how do people productionalize their code? And what are, what are they doing for that? And um, when, when I said yes, it was, it, it is it is kind of a gray area uh, in that some people are, um, like there there are jobs that you know just just regular submitted jobs that go through UC4, um, and then some people are, are literally running them on Docker. We have a we have an entire setup just for for running batch jobs, um, and people will build from the, the big data image, and then that's where they're actually running their jobs on. Um, and then people that are running full servers, I mean, they, they would do the same thing, but with, but with Docker. Oh, um, so we do link outs to commuter and the other step. We, we do have, we have several MB extensions that are all internal, but it's more like they're internal only because they understand like where our data is located and other things. Um, but, but most stuff, we're, we're actually, we pull in a bunch of extensions that are public too, uh, including the hiding of cells, hiding of, hiding of inputs, hiding of outputs. Um, yeah. Question? So the, it, it has the kinds of trade-offs if you're dealing with like free hosting where you're on Heroku versus where you're running, where you have like a, a beefier machine but still like a managed platform for you. I use both and a lot of users use both. Like it's faster to get to the shared, the shared instance one. I mean, but like with, with that ease of access, it's also the, the one with the least amount of resources. Um, and when people need more, they just, they go spin up the one that, I mean, it, it's literally clicking a button. I mean, like, they don't have to go through, they, they just go to, they go to a portal and they say, oh yeah, start my notebook server. Um, and so all that's integrated for them. Yeah. Sorry, repeat that one again. How do you manage projects? Oh, so pe people posted, no, so their code goes to Stash, right? And it's up to them whether they're working on GitHub or Stash or if they have some other process. 
Um, but generally, like, the DFS volume is there for them. We, we manage it and monitor it, but for the most part, it's like their own sandbox. Um, sorry, the, the question itself is like, how do people manage projects? Um, but it's, it's kind of wild west. So, paper, so the question is, uh, is, is paper mill something you just use yourself, or I guess the way you put it was? You were talking about maybe having data attached to the file like through Arrow or something like that. So is mm -hmm. that something you do an analysis and create like a, um, some kind of custom data set based on other data and then share that with the Jupyter file and the Arrow data attached to it with other people, or what's the workflow? I get, yeah, I guess I, I, haven't, I haven't thought through that part. Uh, I mean, generally, paper mill is it's it's just a client, so it, it literally runs runs a notebook, outputs a notebook. Um, so how people want it, like, because it, it it just pulls from a file, whether it's a local file or, or on S3, and then writes out to another file, whether it's local or S3, and it, and it could do it in place. Um, so it's it's open ended. Yeah, so it, it so the question is like why, why are we using EFS and not just EBS? Is that fair? Yeah. The question. Um, we were we were some time ago just using EBS and then backing up their files to um, S3. Um, EFS has actually been really easy to work with. I think I was a naysayer on EFS like maybe a year and a half or two years ago, um, but I'm I'm pretty happy with it now. Um, and be, they, so they do have the, the, the separate machines problem is the main one, one that this solves. Because um, there's actually a third tier. Right. And, and so they, they run jobs, too. And the jobs, too, can mount EFS. And so if you want to have access to those files, I mean, I, I thought everybody would be fully cloudy and they'd pull everything of, off of S3 and stage it locally to slash data. But the reality is people make messy things and then they want to use them right there. We we were using uh, S3 sync. No. What else? So the question was, have I seen people doing things that really surprise me within the notebooks? Um, I mean, every, every time somebody creates something custom with widgets, it's, in, and generally like anything built in the notebook, it's like, it, it finally clicked for me that if you have a running notebook server, um, people basically get to treat it like a web server where they don't have to manage any operations because we're managing it for them. And so they get this platform as a service that's effectively the notebook. They really only have to know how to work in the notebook, but now they have this beautiful thing that can run dynamic custom code, um, and then they, they share the, the URLs for those and people just run them. And I was like, oh, okay, I guess that, I mean, that is a selling point. Um, and it means you know, they don't have to hire some team where you know, they go get two front-end engineers and. Uh, you know, a bunch of ops people just to manage like this one thing for a query that's probably going to change later, and then you know they like deprecate that, and so now there's this like this quick on ramp to to run stuff and then treat that like it's its own its own little uh, setup. Cool. Yep. I'm going to give it in a percentage. 
it's like 30% of people at Netflix. That number could be way wrong now. <laughs> 30% of employees. I would be, it would be great if Netflix users, it was 30% of those. Pretty much every single uh, business area, whether it's marketing or security or, or content or like messaging, um, is, has data scientists on it. Like Netflix is data all the way through. I mean, from, from its very beginning to now. Um, and I remember uh, when I was a mathematician thinking of Netflix with high honors because of the, the Netflix uh, million dollar challenge. Um, and, and that, that culture hasn't, hasn't stopped. So I'm, I'm not gonna give any specifics, but at the very least, like literally every org is, is backed by data and there are plenty of, um, like everyone sharing and trying to figure things out. So. You keep saying when you were a mathematician, did they actually strip you of that? <laughs> I, I, I hung up my badge and said I'm done. <laughs> the question was if I, if, since I was a mathematician, if they like stripped me of it. And, yeah, I don't know. How do you guys manage entitlements and like authorization sharing of notebooks? So how, how do we manage uh, entitlements and sharing of notebooks? All the notebooks are public and accessible to everyone who is um, logged in at Netflix. Netflix generally has a culture of wanting to share information with others, like within the company. Um, so while we have an audit trail, generally speaking, we want everybody to, to be able to work together. Yeah, so in, inside the contain, so the question was, what does the user run as inside of the, um, inside of the container? Uh, and they run as root. Yeah. We hope that people aren't doing that. So how do you manage secrets within the notebook? Um, oh, 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 no. So, so, so sensitive data is, is not over there, or at least. Um, so we, we are watching what, what's going on with data and like who's accessing it and whatnot, uh, and then we'll, we'll clean up stuff. Um, Generally, it's frowned upon to have secrets. People are gonna leak them no matter what. Um, like, developers will leak things all the time. Um, just in general, not just data scientists. Everyone does it. Um, I'm, I'm using, and this is like general stuff, not for Netflix. I usually tell people to use environment variables, but with the notebook. Um, but the other, the other reality is that you might have, so like we actually have an internal store that you can get access to stuff. Most of the time you don't need secrets because we give the, each of the containers has an IAM role which has access to the data that they need. And so they shouldn't be explicitly using secrets that'll end up in code. Is there a different IAM role for different types of secrets? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And so when I say it runs as root, of course it's not really, it's, it's that user but they have root but within the container. Yeah. That's it? Cool. Questions. Um, do you want to tell people about the sprints on Saturday? Please come to the sprints on Saturday. We can work on anything in Jupiter. Um, it, it's a complimentary <laughs> event, but it, you do need to buy a ticket for it on Eventbrite so we can plan for the number of people where we, who will be in the space. So go to Eventbrite, search for JupyterCon sprints. They're here in the building from 9 to 5. Yeah. No. Please.